for you are. Uh, I'm Spiros Maniatis and uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of uh, this fantastic panel. Uh, thanks to uh, Wilmer Hale, thanks to the Institute for Small States and uh, for organizing another conference this year. Uh, it, it's a pity that we cannot uh, meet, uh, we cannot physically meet, uh, but I hope next year it will be a better year and we will be able to meet in person. Uh, we have a, a great panel. Uh, you can read the, the bios uh, at uh, you know, the part of the program. Uh, what I can say is that we had a lot of fun uh, discussing uh, what we will present today. Uh, so, uh, even if it's a conversation between the four of us, it will be a, a great, uh, great panel. So, we have uh, uh, Charlotte Welder that will be looking uh, at the interaction between uh, culture and intellectual property from a specific, from a case study perspective. Uh, then we have, we have Sharon Legal that will be looking at this from a broader perspective, from uh, the West Indies, if you like, uh, base. And then we have uh, Persil Siali, Siaki Sali that will be looking at this from uh, the, the Pacific perspective. There are a number of uh, broad, big questions that uh, we want to cover, looking at the interaction between intellectual property and culture, looking at the protection of culture through uh, intellectual property, looking at the intangible the audio options. Go to the uh, speaker and microphone settings. Me or audio speaker and microphone. So it, it, can you listen to me now? Charlotte, can you listen? Could you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I can hear you. Yeah. I continue then. Uh, and uh, we also want to look at uh, sometimes the tension uh, between protection and the need, the willingness to exploit commercially uh, uh, culture. Uh, we will start with uh, Charlotte, then we'll have Sharon, and then Parcel. Uh, and then we will start the conversation, hoping that uh, uh, the audience will also participate. Thank you, grateful, delighted to be part of the panel. Charlotte, you start. Thank you, Spiros. Um, if I could have my slides up, please, that would be great. Could I have my slides okay yeah, can we have charlotte's slides it's loading yes thank yes, yes. It's coming it's coming right up we will be using a, a combination of technologies today so uh, charlotte uh, will be trusting yep here we are Brilliant. Yes, yes. So, um, yes, I'm I'm having my slides controlled for me. Um, so, um, but uh, thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Spiros, for the introduction. And I too am delighted uh, to be here today. Um, and what I'm going to talk about this morning is a British Academy funded project that I was involved in um, in India between 2018 and 2020 where I work with a team of researchers and an NGO in West Bengal. Um, and the question that we asked was, can intellectual property and marketing help marginalised communities to use their intangible heritage to make a sustainable living? And we call this HIPAMS for short. And one of the communities that we work with in West Bengal was the Perulia Cho dance community. Next slide, please. So this, this project was set against the extensive discussion that's been ongoing in both academia and at international level, including in UNESCO, around the commercialization of intangible cultural heritage. Um, there is a fear that if intangible cultural heritage is commercialized, this is, will result in over-commercialization, in commodification, 
in misappropriation and in decontextualization. Um, equally, it is accepted that where uh, intangible cultural heritage communities choose to do so, commercializing their intangible heritage can result in sustainable livelihoods. However, there's no practical guidance for the communities or for anybody else on advising them on how this might be done and how the harms might be mitigated. Next slide, please. So this is where we came in with our British Academy funded project. The long title was Celebrating Local Stewardship in a Global Market, Community Heritage, Intellectual Property Protection and Sustainable Development in India, which is, I'm sure you can understand why we shortened it to high pounds. And we brought together um, academic experts in intellectual property, in ICH and in marketing. And the NGO that we worked with in Kolkata um, was called Banglanatak. And we work very closely and we work with four communities um, in West Bengal. And the communities were chosen because Banglanatak had already worked with them in helping them use their, use their intangible heritage to make a living. So they'd already brought themselves out of abject poverty and were making something of a living through commercializing their intangible heritage. Next slide, please. Now, one of the communities we worked with, as I said, was the Perulia Cho dance community. And there are three different, or there are a number of different forms of Cho dance in West Bengal. Uh, Perulia Cho dance is the most um, acrobatic of the forms of dance. Um, and it's distinguished through its, uh, uh, the dancers wear very ornate masks. And through their dances, the dancers uh, uh, work through a number of different Indian epics. Um, the dancers also work with um, traditional singers and musicians. And traditionally, it's a very male dominated form, although more recently, a number of girl troops have also been established. Next slide, please. So the heritage sensitive intellectual property and marketing strategies were designed to bring together thinking about marketing, IP and ICH, with the strategies being worked out at the intersection of these disciplines. Um, we needed to understand the market and how IP could support marketing strategies while ensuring that a real core focus was maintained on the intangible heritage skills. Next slide, please. The communities were very much at the centre of the High Pams process, and the High Pams strategies were co-created with the communities. We used inclusive met methods, including forum theatre and walking stories, digital storytelling, um, as well as uh, other types of methods, including questionnaires, and we did desk-based research. Um, we work very closely with our Bangladesh attack colleagues to overcome language bar barriers and everything we did was co-created with the communities. Um, we developed the high plans process through the start was with a meeting with the communities and an in-face in meeting with the communities to find out what was important to them about their intangible heritage, what they already knew about marketing and intellectual property and what problems they had encountered when commercializing their ICH. And the research team then took this information and worked on developing marketing strategies, which were supported by IP um, and which would help to contribute towards sustainable development. We then took these ideas back to the communities and discussed them with the communities who chose what they wanted to implement. And between us, we decided who should do what. The strategies were then implemented by the communities with the help of Banglanatak, and we then carried out um, some evaluation. Next slide, please. Uh, we had a number of outputs from the project, including um, a toolkit. And this toolkit contains details of the process that we went through. And it also contains a number of the tools that we used during the course of the project. One of these tools was called the Roots and Fruits tool. And the purpose of this tool was to help the communities to envisage what the roots of their intangible heritage are and how these then can then manifest themselves in the fruits of their endeavors. 
So the purpose was really to help the communities focus on the skills and knowledge that were important to them as ICH bearers. Then while retaining a focus on those skills, they can develop innovations that remain rooted in the core ICH skills. It feeds into the concern around decontextualization in particular, through focusing on the roots of the tradition, it helps communities to avoid decontextualization of their heritage. Next slide. So bringing these uh, skills together, the marketing and IP skills with a focus on ICH keeps the communities at the core of the strategy and helps to contribute towards sustainable development when they commercialize their ICH. Next slide. We also developed what we called a high pounds canvas. And the purpose of this was to help thinking about the different disciplines, the marketing, intellectual property and intangible cultural heritage and how they came together in the project. Um, when we started the project, we talked about, well, this is what marketing does, this is what IP does, this is where ICH sits. And we wanted to move beyond a focus on these individual disciplines. Um, and talk instead, and we together we worked out that instead we could talk about community empowerment, heritage skills repertoire heritage sens sensitive innovation and reputation. So, for example, community empowerment refers to the ability of community members to manage or control their heritage and benefit from it. It's relevant to the relationships between artists and the community and their relationships with third parties. Reputation refers to the status and respect given to the heritage and bearer community, which is linked to its value and meaning. And this can benefit the reputation of the artists and their products as well. Next slide. So how does this all relate to Perulia Cho uh, at dance and intellectual property? When we first talked to the community in the High Prime's process, they told us that Perulia Cho should be better known and they wanted more opportunities to perform. We suggested that ways of doing this would be through promoting the collective identity for an association that would represent them and through developing quality digital storytelling, improving understanding of performances in other language languages and developing cultural codes that were rooted in intellectual property and human rights and which could help with their negotiations with festival organizers and others. As regards using intellectual properties to support these strategies, we suggested training in, in intellectual property rights to help them understand their rights and manage them, which could include managing rights on the website and at festivals and how to use the code in negotiations. Next slide, please. Okay, so the communities then decided this on the strategies they wanted to implement. Um, this include included developing a website to showcase Perulia Cho and on which the artist would be identified and credited, which is rooted in performers rights and copyright and through which their community and, and uh, community and heritage would be showcased and explained. They also increased their use of their Facebook platform again, making sure that there was sufficient credit when they did. And together we developed an ethical code for the communities rooted, as I said, in UNESCO's ethical principles, general human rights norms and intellectual property. One of the main drivers for this code came from a story that a young female Cho dancer, Moshu, Moshumi Chowdhury told us. Moshu, Moshumi and her all female group of Cho dancers had appeared in an Indian film that had been inspired by Moshumi's life. Now, while the dancers were paid for their single performance when it was when the film was filmed, they were not they were not named in the credits of the film, as was their right as performers and possibly also as authors of copyright. This code explicitly states that when Cho dancers are employed by filmmakers in this way, they should be credited. The Cho dancers give the code to the filmmakers during negotiations. Next slide. Thinking about the reputation of both Perulia Cho as a dance form and of individual dancers, the community chose to develop their digital storytelling film, uh, skills. Um, these, we provided training, um, both in developing the, the digital skills and IP training, 
um, encouraging them in particular to think to think about um, ensuring that dances were credited, but also when others took photographs of them, such as at uh, festivals, to request that a CCBYNC license uh, would be used to allow others to circulate their, their works, but also to ensure that the works were used in a non-commercial basis. Um, the CCBYNC license was something very new to the community, understandably, but they picked up the idea really very quickly. Um, it may not be understood or effective to start off with, but from a strategic perspective, the reason we encouraged the communities and the audience to start thinking about using it was to get used to the idea that there is an intellectual property right um, that subsists in uh, records of the images of the dancers. None of them, understandably, wanted uh, audiences not to circulate images of them. But the idea was rather to start to emphasise the underlying property right and to stress the need for attribution. And also that money should not be made by third parties out of these images. Next slide, please. And thinking about heritage sensitive, sensitive in innovation and, and thinking again about the roots and fruits um, tool, uh, one of the, um, so, so using the, uh, the skills in the roots and innovating through the fruits, um, the, the Prulia Cho community created two new dances with, which were steeped in traditional moves, masks and music, but which were innovative in the form of uh, the stories that they told. One dealt with uh, COVID-19 and the other talked about the dancer behind the mask, which was a clear reference to Mashimi and her experiences with the film company. So next slide, please. Now, five points underpinned the development of the intellectual property strategy that in itself underpinned the marketing strategy in this project. Um, the first was that the IP rights should be used in a way that reflected their theor theoretical origins. In other words, they were not used in a vacuum. The second was that the IP rights were used as tools to underpin marketing strategy which and the marketing strategy had as its main focus the intangible heritage this meant that we used the intellectual property rights mainly for promotional and community communicative purposes and allied to this was the third point in that it was practically impossible not practically impossible but pr impossible in a practical way um, for the communities to enforce their intellectual property rights Therefore, using them as promotional and communicative mechanisms rather than as defensive mechanisms moved away from the need to think about enforcement by the communities of their rights. Fourthly, it was the recognition um, that some rights, some intellectual property rights are communitarian by nature, while others are individualistic. Um, communitarian rights such as GIs, individualistic rights such as copyright. And we were acutely aware that uh, intangible cultural heritage is a community endeavour. So there was a very sensitive balance to be had between uh, community rights and individual rights and how these actually played out in practice. And the fifth point was around whether there was an association in place. And if there was, it was possible to think about collective rights. If there wasn't, then collective rights such as collective trademarks or GIs. If there wasn't, then um, uh, collective rights became more difficult to um, implement by the communities. Um, next slide, please. We carried out um, an, an evaluation right at the end of the project. Um, now, this obviously was very early for an evaluation to be carried out, and we would like to do one, uh, another one five years down the line. But I think it's also worth remembering that half of our project was carried out in lockdown. Um, we did uh, have, our, have meetings with the communities 2008, 2019, um, until such time as the pandemic really struck, uh, hit in. Um, uh, Banglan attack, our uh, colleagues from the NGO in Kolkata, Kolkata then took over within COVID pro protocols implementation of the project. So while we managed to complete the project, it was 
not done quite in the way that we had anticipated in the, in the beginning. Um, we, but despite that, we got some very interesting feedback from the Cho dancers. And some of the things I liked particularly was the featuring of the Cho dance on COVID-19 on local television. And also one of the statement by one, one dancer, I worked in seven movies where our art was recognized, but our names were not given. The names of the cast and crew are given, but our names are nowhere to be found. Now I have understood, so I will claim the recognition whenever a booking comes. Next slide, please. Um, we had a number of points that was, and, and sometimes some really quite heated discussion amongst the project team. Not that this was, this was when we were talking about um, the, how we had placed the project. Um, and three particular areas um, perhaps arose during these discussions. One was over the meaning of over commercialization. One was over when it was appropriate to use the term misappropriation. And the other, which was one of the main questions that we had when we first applied for funding for this project, was whether the harms of over commercialization, misappropriation, and so on could be mitigated through using intellectual property. Um, I should say that none of these were resolved uh, in the team and we agreed uh, to disagree. Next slide, please. So just very briefly, some concluding thoughts. Um, coming to the end of the project, uh, we came to the view that IP can be a useful tool when it's used to complement marketing strategies um, and maintaining the focus on intangible cultural heritage. Um, a pragmatic realism when working on these projects is essential. Um, and the HIPAM's methodology is applicable to empowering a broad range of intellectual uh, and tangible cultural heritage communities within India and beyond. In India, as I say, we, we worked with four communities, the Perulia Cho dance community, the Bal, members of the Bal Fakiri community, Patichitra painters and the Chow mask makers. We're working on another project at the moment where we're using the methodology in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and we are finding some, some good results there as well. Thank you. That's me. Thank you, Charlotte. Can I ask a question about the, uh, the point you made about the difficulty, the practical difficulty of uh, enforcing intellectual property uh, rights? Is it, is it because of the, the way the rights are perceived? Is it because of the intellectual property environment? And uh, what were the main obstacles? Uh, um, uh, the communities that we worked with lived in rural, ben rural West Bengal. Um, they were, they, there were no, you know, sort of main local roads. There was very little transport. There was, you know, sort of very, they, they did have mobile phones, some of them. Um, but uh, they are communities who it is only over the past five to 10 years have been brought out of abject po poverty. The thought, there is no, and there is no, you know, there's no um, sort of organization that could say, your rights have been infringed, we need to take an action for you. So it, it's purely practical issues. In addition, I think it is not unfair to say that the Indian legal system can be quite long, um, uh, you know, sort of can involve quite a long process in order to get any uh, any redress. So the practical, in, it practically enforcing them is impossible. Uh, geographical indications uh, where the Patichitra community had a geographical indication, um, that is managed by a third party. So could um, you know, sort of have assistance in enforcing that, but otherwise it's not possible. Yeah. But it's fascinating that distance that uh, you and they have covered during a very short period of time. Uh, the yeah. statement, next time I will ask for my name to be there. Uh, that's, what, that's what you mean, yeah. Okay, we'll come back to that and then I have a trademark question as well, because I'm a trademark lawyer, but we'll come back to that. Uh, thank you so much. Sharon, you are next. Thank you very much. Um, could you load my slides, please? 
Hello. While we're waiting, okay, thank you. While we're waiting for the slides, hello, thank you very much, Charlotte, for that very interesting presentation. And while I'll be looking at it primarily, almost exclusively from a legal perspective, it's interesting to see how some of the things we have in a legal structure can actually be implemented. And you're right when, you're, when you said that there were practical issues and challenges, because you can have the best legal system and the most accommodating legal system, but there may be practical issues like roads, utilities, access to information that would render that legal system, you know, practically irrelevant. So it was interesting to hear about some of the challenges that that, that community engaged. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to be a part of this panel. Um, very interesting presentation that preceded me and I'm also looking forward to hearing uh, the presentation that's coming. I will focus on the intersection of cultural identity and intellectual property. Next slide, please. Okay, so this presentation will explore ways in which identity is presented in intellectual property law, specifically copyright law in its conventional and expanded forms, and look at how we can make intellectual property laws more, the I say, accommodating to collectively derived cultural express expressions and address some policy issues that may inform a more, a more accommodating intellectual property law system. Policy questions around what is protected, why should protection be afforded, who is protected and how, okay? So I will be discussing briefly cultural identity in international law, because when you're looking at collectively derived cultural expressions, identity features in that uh, scenario. Historically, cultural property, the, the cultural property regime uh, focused on built heritage. And when that cultural property regime transformed to intangible cultural property protection, that is where there was an intersection between intellectual property rights and the cultural heritage regime, okay? Uh, how identity is reflected in conventional copyright law. And as I mentioned before, the policy questions that would inform a more inclusive intellectual property system or a sui generis property system that will accommodate collectively derived cultural expressions. Next slide, please. So culture and identity have been increasingly recognized as key influences in national and international lawmaking. And at times it's at the core of protection measures. So the Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions is one example where some of the objectives of that convention include promoting respect for the diversity of cultural expressions and raising awareness of its value at the local, national, and international levels, reaffirming the importance of the link between culture and the development and development for all countries, particularly development countries, and giving recognition to the distinctive nature of cultural activities, goods, services, as vehicles of identity, values, and meaning. Next slide, please. So these are some of the definitions that, uh, that may be relevant when looking at that particular convention. I wouldn't go into it. You can go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So culture, identity, and intellectual property coalesced with a shift in focus in cultural property laws from the protection of natural and built tangible culture to intangible culture. And we are familiar with the historic uh, conventions that protected cultural property, built cultural property through armed conflict, preventing their destruction, the preservation of those monuments and natural heritage, and the prohibition against the illegal trade in, in movable cultural property. But all of this focused on tangible cultural property. Next slide, please. So in terms of intangible culture, 
of course, the, in, the International Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, uh, the ICH Convention, that was the first cultural property convention that focused on intangible, the protection of intangible cultural property. And at that time, at the time that that, that convention was being adopted, at the World Intellectual Property Organization, the Inter Governmental Committee on Intellectual Property, Genetic Resources, Traditional Knowledge and Folklore, the IGC, was in its fifth session deliberating on, among other things, national experiences with intellectual property protection of traditional knowledge, sui generis legislation for the protection of traditional cultural expressions and managing intellectual property when documenting traditional knowledge. Next slide, please. Now, in conventional intellectual property law, issues of identity are not paramount, but neither are they absent. Now, intellectual property theory, particularly the personality theory of intellectual property rights, link the creation with the personality and identity of the creator as a basis for grounding property rights. In copyright law specifically, there's the moral right of attribution, and that preserves the link between creator and creation. That's the right to be identified with what you have created. And that moral right of attribution is supported by the integrity right to prevent unauthorized changes to the work that may compromise the reputation of the creator. So in conventional copyright law, there are provisions to protect identity, so to speak, and to protect, protect the link between the creator and the creation. Next slide, please. The typical categories of works protected by copyright law include literary, dramatic, musical, artistic works. However, where protection is expanded or proposed to be expanded beyond those conventional categories to include traditional cultural expressions, which are indistinguishable from intangible cultural heritage protected by the ICH convention, its use of identity and culture come into sharper focus. Next slide, please. Now, how is identity and intellectual property, how do they coincide in Caribbean legislation? So in the Commonwealth Caribbean, the way in which tra traditional cultural expressions are protected or purported to be protected is through the use of copyright legislation. And we've known for a while that copyright legislation tend to protect individual creation of individual authors. And it's not necessarily accommodating to collective creations. So there have been attempts to amend conventional copyright legislation to incorporate some aspect of protection for those practitioners of traditional cultural expressions. Now, in the Caribbean, our copyright law makes reference to either folklore or expressions of folklore, okay? So the Antigua and Barbuda Act, for example, protects performers of expressions of folklore. The Barbados Copyright Act protects folklore itself and the, and the government is charged with the responsibility for exercising rights in relation to folklore. Next slide, please. Dominica, similar to Barbados, where performers of expressions of folklore are protected as well as the expressions of folklore themselves. Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago recently amended their copyright legislation to protect performers of expressions of folklore. Next slide, please. In general, protection through copyright law is afforded to folklore that constitute a basic element of the traditional heritage of the country, was created by various groups of the community and survived from generation to generation. In some instances, copyright protection is afforded to expressions of folklore that are group-oriented and tradition-based creations of groups or individuals which reflect the standards, values, cultural and social identity of a community transmitted orally or by other means. Now, where 
expressions of folklore are proposed to be protected in legislation in the Commonwealth Caribbean, the government is charged with the responsibility for ensuring that those rights are protected. Next slide, please. Beyond the existing protection afforded to folklore or traditional cultural expressions in the Caribbean, there has been attempts to develop more compre a more comprehensive regime of protection over the last decade. Some Caribbean member states actively participate in the WIPO Intergovernmental Committee, where, the, where there is a move to develop draft treaty provisions for the protection of traditional cultural expressions on the one hand and traditional knowledge on the other. Why is WIPO looking at this? Because there are, as Charlotte alluded to, a lot of these intellectual property rights are focused on protecting the individual. Okay. So there needs to be a regime that recognizes the collective origins of the traditional cultural expressions or folklore and develop a structure around facilitating the collective enforcement and protection of those rights. Next slide, please. Issues of culture and identity are more evident in, ongoing, on the, in, in the ongoing development of international, international measures to protect traditional cultural expressions. And as we in the Caribbean attempt to look at a suitable framework to protect traditional cultural expression, there are some policy questions that are important to be answered, like what is protected? Why should protection be offered? Who is protected? and how should protection be implemented and articulated? And in all these policy questions, identity is featured in one way or the other. Next slide, please. So in terms of what is protected, <clears throat> protection is proposed for traditional cultural expressions that are traceable to a particular group, region, or country, oral in nature, intergenerational, and linked to the identity of the source groups or communities. Next slide, please. Why should we protect traditional cultural expressions? Well, one rationale for creating a protection regime is to preserve cultural diversity and protect cultural identity. Another rationale for constructing a regime of protection is to prevent the misappropriation of traditional cultural expressions. Another rationale is to facilitate the equitable sharing of benefits from the use of traditional cultural expressions and to encourage the respect for other forms of cultural expressions and create some parity between those cultural expressions that are collectively derived and those that are traditionally protected by a, an intellectual property regime, specifically the copyright regime. Next slide, please. Who is protected? The, there's a range of beneficiaries that could be included in a protection regime under consideration um, in the Caribbean. Indigenous communities, traditional communities, local communities, religious communities, individuals, and states. And the link, there should be, however, a link between those beneficiaries and some kind of cultural affiliation with the relevant group that is responsible for, you know, maintaining the traditional cultural expressions. Next slide, please. How should we protect these uh, collectively derived cultural expressions? Well, some of, the, some of the rights proposed would be a right to equitable benefit sharing, a right to prevent unauthorized use, a right to be identified as the source of the traditional cultural expression, and a right to prevent distortion of the traditional cultural expression, and that could be linked to questions of decontextualization of the traditional cultural expression. Next slide, please. In looking at how we develop a, a Caribbean model for protecting traditional cultural expressions, we are guided by uh, the draft WIPO treaties that are under uh, the discussion and deliberation. We looked at the African Regional Intellectual Property Organization, Swakaman Protocol, 
on the protection of traditional knowledge and expressions of folklore. We also looked at the Pacific regional framework for the protection of traditional knowledge and expressions of culture and the draft legal instrument for the South Asian Association. So they're, they're, they're models that we, we, all, we have looked at and that will inform what kind of protection regime we conceptualize for the Caribbean given our own peculiarities. Next slide, please. In terms of leveraging intellectual property to protect traditional cultural expressions, I just want to mention one of several programs um, that the World Intellectual Property Organization is involved with, and it involves training, mentoring, and matchmaking. Um, and it's a focus on women entrepreneurs with persons in industry to assist with the development of their traditional cultural expressions and traditional knowledge. And the most recent uh, installment of that training took place uh, last month, uh, where there was a two week virtual practical workshop for women entrepreneurs from indigenous peoples and local communities. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you. Uh, I remember I was invited many, many years ago uh, to give a presentation about intellectual property protection to, I suppose, the, the, the originator behind the program that you mentioned. That oh, okay. Uh, and it was about English speaking uh, entrepreneurs, but that was probably 25 years ago. Uh, okay. Wonderful. <laughs> fascinating. Uh, the very practical questions that uh, entrepreneur, you know, women entrepreneurs were asking about how we can make money out of this, but how we can also protect it in a way that it does not destabilize the social, cultural, yes. and it doesn't take away the commercial value that uh, we want, the over commercialization by entities that are not linked. Uh, with, uh, with with what we're doing and, and with that. And this is something that I, I, I would like to, to explore a little bit more further. There, there was another point that, that you made, uh, the distinction of the continuation between culture, folklore, and expression of folklore. Uh, and then going back to Charlotte, uh, there was this, uh, I think, fascinating distinction between the roots and the fruits. So mm. you have uh, the overly, I, I would call it culture, uh, the, the, the internalized, sometimes intellectual, not visible in a way, tangible, uh, uh, route towards creation. And then you, you have the fruits that are visible, more tangible, and yeah. broad, uh, more exploitable. Now, looking at culture and folklore, uh, uh, do you think that Culture is the roots, culture are the roots, or folklore, uh, 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 you know, mm. in, in, in your version of what Sharon was describing. Well, I would say folklore is a subset of culture. Folklore okay. is a subset of expressive culture, because if you look at culture very broadly, it could be built culture, how we live, what we eat, the clothes we wear. So I think folklore, I would consider folklore a subset of culture, an aspect of it. And expressions of folklore would be, well, an example would be what, something similar to what Charlotte spoke about. Expressions of folklore would be dance, storytelling, but it's based on or coming from a cultural root. I don't know if that sort of explains, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. These are the fruits then, yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> roots and fruits. <laughs> Sharon, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, brilliant. And now, Marcel. Sorry, bear with me. <laughs> 
Is that coming through? Okay, awesome. <clears throat> All right, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, the invitation to speak, and it was a lot, uh, fascinating to hear uh, the panelists um, talking about their contribution to this panel. So thank you very much. Um, it's quite a privilege to be invited to speak to this conference. Uh, so thank you to Professor Butler for the invitation. Uh, today I'll be talking about the protection of traditional knowledge and expressions of culture in the Pacific. Uh, I will be focusing primarily on the uh, Pacific Regional Framework um, of the protection of traditional knowledge and expressions of culture. I will refer to that as the model law. Um, before I begin, I thought I might provide a brief outline of my presentation. So I will briefly discuss traditional knowledge and how it fits or doesn't fit within IP law. Um, I will then cover some of the examples of where traditional knowledge and expressions of culture have been uh, misappropriated. After that, I'll discuss the model law, cover some of the key provisions, and highlight some of the uh, Pacific countries who have uh, adopted the model law or have legislation protecting traditional knowledge and taking inspiration from the model law. I will then discuss some of the things that countries should consider when adopting the model law before concluding with a summary of regional and international movements around uh, protection of traditional knowledge. So there are various versions of the definition of traditional knowledge. This can mean different things to different communities. Uh, there's no one accepted definition um, of the term at the international level. Um, but traditional knowledge has of uh, traditional knowledge of indigenous people has unique features. Uh, it's usually unwritten, uh, passed down from orally from generation to generation. Uh, the owner can be a tribe, community, or clan, or individual. Uh, some forms of traditional knowledge uh, are ex expressed through stories, legends, folklore, rituals, and uh, songs. And because it's passed down um, orally and exists as practice and custom, sometimes it's difficult to identify its owner. There are many reasons why conventional IP systems and traditional knowledge are in incompatible. IP laws such as copyright only protect the expression of an idea rather than the idea itself. Um, IP law protects rights to known individuals. Um, IP rights are of uh, limited duration and may be assigned or sold to other people. On the contrary, uh, traditional knowledge and expressions of culture are communally owned by communities and are essential parts of cultural identity. Moreover, traditional knowledge and expressions of culture include both the knowledge and expression of that knowledge, and this is knowledge passed down from generation to generation. Another issue with IP systems is that they require the disclosure of information in order to uh, receive protection. Uh, even if the traditional owners um, wish to register patents on traditional knowledge, it may be culturally inappropriate to record the knowledge in writing. Uh, and some owners are uh, traditional owners are skeptical of disclosing their, their knowledge for fear of access and abuse by those who are not entitled to that knowledge. Here are, are a couple of many examples of where traditional knowledge and expressions of culture have been misappropriated. Uh, and left hand side, you'll, um, you'll see the, some tight fitting women's sportswear was produced by Nike in 2013 using the Samoan Tatao design. Uh, this caused outrage in the uh, Samoan communities because Samoans traditionally use the design for men, not women. The specific design at issue is a distinctive part of Samoan culture tra traditionally only given to Samoan warriors or chiefs. Furthermore, only a select few of have the knowledge and skills passed down from earlier generations necessary for the title. It's also a matter of disrespect. Um, the real issue here is that Nike did not consult or request uh, consent from the Samoan community uh, before uh, promoting their sportswear. They, they eventually uh, withdrew uh, from production and uh, made a public apology. On the other hand, uh, on the, the, the other example is a screenshot from the Heineken's um, ad promoting the Rugby World Cup 2015. So here you see three Maori men 
were indigenous people of New Zealand, Aotearoa, uh, performing the haka. Now, the haka is, um, a, is, like, is a war dance um, owned by the Māori, uh, the Whenua Māori people in New Zealand, um, and many different types of hakas. It's, it's, it's a war dance, but it's also used in, in uh, very special occasions like uh, weddings or uh, funerals. I think the most well the most well known example is kamate, uh, which is performed by the uh, All Blacks before their rugby match. So here you, uh, we have three Maori men performing the haka on um, unsuspecting customers. They are then challenged to do their own haka, and the way that this ad is portrayed is in light of um, it provides a uh, humorous light where people are laughing, they are making fun of the actions. Um, some of the people doing the haka are using kamate because that's the only haka they know but the actions are wrong the words are wrong um, the two females in this video who uh, do the haka also poke out their tongue which is seen as against tikana or the rules um, um, in the maori community um, so this is just some of the many examples in the world you see of misappropriation the countries can turn to a sort of generous framework to address the issues of conventional IP um, legal, uh, legal frameworks. In this case, a uh, sort of generous approach refers to the development of a new national law or the establishment of international norms that protect IP concerning traditional knowledge and expressions of culture, one of them being the model law. Uh, theoretically, a sort of generous approach can fill in the gaps that conventional IP systems have. This model law in particular was developed in 2002 um, and was uh, accepted by Pacific Island Forum's ministers and, and adopted in 2003. The objective of the model law is to protect the rights of traditional owners over the traditional knowledge, uh, protect the rights of traditional owners over their knowledge and expressions of culture. It allows for commercialization of the, the knowledge and expressions of culture subject to informed and prior consent from the owners. The model law doesn't extend to other dimensions of traditional knowledge, such as uh, knowledge connected to biological resources. The scope and nature of protection and exceptions uh, it offers are based most directly upon common right principles and are therefore most applicable to artistic, musical and expressions of culture. So the model law provides its own definition of traditional knowledge and incorporates some of the uh, uh, key aspects that I mentioned in the previous slides is intergenerational, it's passed up from generation, uh, it's collectively held, um, can be expressed through different means, but it provides a broad scope of uh, protection um, compared to some of the other instruments that uh, you've, you've seen, you can find in internationally. It also provides a uh, definition of expressions of culture, but uh, these are uh, a non-exhaustive list uh, and it's intended to provide a basis for discussion. Uh, some countries have a significant number of distinct traditional communities and would therefore need to determine whether the description sufficiently accommodates that diversity. The approach taken in the model law is to create new rights in traditional knowledge and expressions of culture which previously might have been regarded for the purpose of IP law as part of the public domain. Uh, the rights created in the model law essentially fall into two categories, uh, traditional cultural rights and moral rights. Uh, the existence of these rights do not depend upon registration or other formalities. Uh, traditional cultural rights grant traditional owners exclusive rights uh, in respect to a range of, non, a range of uses of traditional knowledge and expressions of culture um, that are of non-customary nature. Uh, rights include the right to reproduce traditional knowledge and expressions of culture, to broadcast it, to translate, and uh, many more. Uh, the moral rights created um, include the right to attribution, the right to false attribution, and uh, right against uh, derogatory treatment in respect to the traditional knowledge and expressions of culture. Uh, so these rights are perpetual, uh, inalienable, cannot be transferred uh, or waived. So the model law regulates the non-customary use of traditional knowledge and expressions of culture. 
when a person or group of, or organization wishes to use the knowledge or expressions of culture for non customer use, they must seek the prior informed consent of the traditional owners. Uh, the model law provides two avenues uh, for prospective users uh, can use to seek the prior informed consent of the owners. These include uh, applying to, the, to a cultural authority, uh, which has functions. Uh, in relation to identifying traditional owners and acting as liaison between prospective users and traditional owners, or dealing directly with the owners themselves. In both cases, though, uh, the prior and informed consent of the owners is to be demonstrated by an authorized user agreement. And in both cases, uh, the cultural authority has a role in providing advice to, tra to traditional owners about the terms and conditions of the authorized user agreements. Um, so as maintaining a record of the finalized authorized user agreements, uh, signed user agreements need to be provided to the cultural authority within a certain period, or else they will be deemed null and void. Uh, so as I previously mentioned, uh, the model requires establishment of cultural authority. Um, it has various functions such as applications, dealing with applications for from prospective users, uh, monitoring compliance, with um, authorized users uh, agreements, um, code of ethics, uh, maintain a record of uh, traditional owners and uh, knowledge and expressions of culture. Enacting countries uh, can decide whether to create an entirely new body to act as the cultural authority or to design or to assign the functions of the authority to an existing body. Um, so the model law suggests uh, several offences for infringing on traditional cultural rights and moral rights. Uh, and one thing to note is that members of the uh, WIPO IGC or the World Intellectual Property uh, Organization Inter Intergovernmental Committee on the Intellectual Property of Genetic Resources, Traditional Knowledge and Folklore oh there, um, would find it difficult to agree upon uh, these offences. Uh, these offences are um, imposed that, um, actually more severe than um, the only existing multilateral agreement on point, which is the uh, TRIPS agreement, uh, the agreement on trade related aspects on intellectual property rights. Uh, so these include um, using traditional knowledge, expressions of culture without prior informed consent, um, uh, infringement on moral rights, uh, and deals with importation and exportation of traditional uh, knowledge and expressions of culture. You'll notice here that there are two layers of um, traditional knowledge and expressions of culture uh, under the model law, whereby sacred secret material are provided with a stronger degree of, of protection. It has its own provision. Um, and below that, uh, all other levels of, or all other types of traditional knowledge and expressions of culture, which are to be treated equally. Um, this approach is taken, uh, this is an approach similar to that taken by the WIPO IGC, um, but whether traditional knowledge and expressions of culture are treated differently or have various layers for protection is for enacting countries to decide. There are, however, situations where traditional cultural rights do not apply to uh, specific non-customary uses of uh, traditional knowledge and expressions of culture. And these are just some, uh, these include criticism or review, incidental use, judicial proceedings. Um, when I when I initially read the model law, I found it quite interesting that um, judicial proceedings were there um, because uh, judicial proceedings, court proceedings, they are a product of colonization. And so when um, you bring in traditional knowledge into the court proceedings, they're essentially saying uh, we're not breaching your rights. Um, but that's, but just, that was just my initial thought. Um, some of the remedies include uh, these are just some of the many remedies uh, provided under model law, um, but it all depends on the on the country itself on what uh, is appropriate for the country. Uh, monetary compensation may not be suitable in all cases, um, as it essentially places a dollar value on traditional knowledge on the on the particular traditional knowledge or expressions of culture, and that can be quite deemed quite offensive, especially with sacred secret. Um, traditional knowledge expressions of culture. Uh, and so an apology in, in other cases might be more meaningful. So the model law was 
as I previously mentioned, the model law was developed in 2002. And so far, there are three countries um, in the Pacific who have uh, either adopted the model law or have uh, taken inspiration from the model law uh, to develop their own legislation protecting traditional knowledge. First is New Way in 2012, uh, followed by the Cook Islands in 2013, and the most recent one, uh, Manawatu, uh, the Protection of Traditional Knowledge Expressions of Culture Act uh, 21 of uh, 2019. Um, the, the Vanuatu Act uh, takes in quite a few provisions from the model law, but it also adds other things that are not included in the model law, which includes uh, a traditional knowledge and expressions of culture fund, uh, providing funding to develop and promote traditional knowledge and expression of culture, creativity and innovation um, to, uh, impl and to implement the, that protection regime and public awareness um, raising activities. And the fund can be used to develop research, management, leadership, and entrepreneurial skills for traditional knowledge owners. And the other um, deal, other addition to the act is the border control and export licenses or what happens when traditional knowledge uh, expressions of culture uh, are imported or exported uh, include and includes biological and genetic materials. Uh, um, academic um, Randa Forsyth argues that a, pl a pluralistic approach to the protection of traditional knowledge in any jurisdiction should be adopted. Um, a pluralist approach would require a bottom-up process which involves widespread consultation with customary leaders during the development stage for the model law. Um, engaging with customary leaders and institutions should not be considered later in the implementation process, nor should it be seen as an opportunity to simply uh, inform communities of the implications of a uh, new legal framework. It's important for uh, enacting states uh, to act as a facilitator and advisor rather than the primary regulator. Uh, enacting countries may assist in various ways, including um, the mediation between traditional owners and prospective users, uh, both inside and outside the enacting country, um, the processes may be uh, may need to be developed to assist um, to assist customer institutions enforcing decisions about um, regarding traditional knowledge expressions of culture. Um, enacting countries should also act as a gatekeeper to ensure that research and other activities of developers and researchers are monitored and opportunities for exploitation are diminished. Uh, this could be in the form of granting research permits, such as uh, countries like. BG of Vanuatu, who, um, who they, they have adopted. Uh, empowering customary leaders and institutions uh, to develop norms and processes for regulating the use of traditional knowledge and expressions of culture should be the core of any new protection system. It, uh, it's essential to provide a platform for discussions for customary leaders um, from each community to discuss competing aims of commercialization and conservation. Oh. While Pacific Islanders are innovative, many of the customary leaders are wise and informed by deep understandings of their people and the forces at play within them. Therefore, there's every chance that they will come up with resolutions that will work with, uh, for their people, but might also be unanticipated to foreigners. It's also essential for enacting countries to fully inform the local communities of uh, what legal protections are provided uh, or better still provide, but uh, involve those communities in the laws and development. Uh, education workshops uh, and campaigns on the importance of IP protection uh, for traditional knowledge and expressions of culture should be provided, targeting communities, children, um, government agencies. Um, increasing awareness involves disseminating policies and laws involving social media to inform and educate the community and uh, establishing a regional IP and traditional knowledge, uh, expressions of culture and genetic resources, network of government officials, practitioners and other stakeholders. So within the Pacific, there is, um, there's the model law, which I've just discussed. Uh, there's also the, the, at the, at the time that the model law was developed, um, the model law for the protection of traditional biological knowledge and innovations and practices was also developed um, 
but I have not seen any countries who have taken that model law. Um, also within the region, uh, it's the Melanesian Spearhead Group um, Framework Treaty on the Protection of Traditional Knowledge and Expressions of Culture. Uh, the treaty was signed in 2011 and provides a framework to protect traditional owners, uh, tr traditional knowledge holders and owners against any infringement of their rights as recognized by the treaty and to ensure a stronger, closer um, cooperation and understanding among members of the MSG. Uh, internationally, uh, there is uh, the WIPO IGC um, are working on an international instrument that protects traditional knowledge. Uh, has been intensively discussed by WIPO and the World um, Trade Organization, um, including two major proposals, such as uh, amending the TRIPS agreement to involve, uh, to, to include disclosure of, of origin um, of genetic resources and traditional knowledge and prior informed consent as official requirements for patents and uh, establishing databases and re uh, registers. Uh, to provide information to patent officers on traditional knowledge as prior art. Um, it's worth noting that many international laws tend to draw on the provisions of existing national laws. Uh, the Paris Convention, for example, uh, sought to harmonize national patent laws, which proved inadequate in protecting inventors operating beyond national boundaries. Likewise, uh, the Berne Convention drew on existing national copyright laws to establish minimum international standards for copyright uh, protection. Uh, but when it comes to the protection of traditional knowledge, the limited number of countries that have national laws in place makes developing an international framework based on existing laws all the more challenging. Uh, any attempt to uh, establish an international regime needs to be carefully uh, needs to carefully define international policy objectives, particularly in terms of what and who needs to be protected. Uh, another important step is to clearly identify points of convergence in national laws. Uh, the protection of traditional knowledge um, at international will depend on the efforts of every country, uh, community, and indigenous groups uh, to find its own way to protect traditional knowledge and expressions of culture. So. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Oh. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I, have, I have a couple of questions uh, uh, about this, this tension. Uh, yep. who, is the, who is the owner of, of the right? Mm. Uh, yes. And, and how do you, you know, who is the owner who exercises the right? How do you resolve disputes about ownership uh, mm. within? A... Because if you have an individual who is the owner of something that is new, and that individual leaves the community or dies or, or, or whatever, what's happening to that right? Uh, and if there is a dispute within the community, how do you resolve that dispute? Yes, sir. Uh, the introduction of the concept of ownership, um, traditional knowledge, but well, it is quite, it, it's a new and troublesome concept. Uh, it's uh, just because it recognizes the um, communal or individual ownership doesn't avoid difficulties that can arise in determining membership of the uh, ownership group. So with the, with the model law, um, the cultural authority is required to identify the owners. Um, they, once they receive an application from a prospective user, uh, they publish it and uh, for while national circulation and the owners have 28 days to advise uh, the authority of their claim. Um, and if the authority believes that they've identified all the, uh, the owners, then they must write a written um, determination. But in the model law, it doesn't, there's no criteria uh, to assist in determining what standard or uh, satisfaction is required. Um, it's uh, this one requirement is that the so the cultural authority just notes down who the who the owners are, make a decision, publish it, and so there's no effective way for contesting owners to appeal the uh, cultural authority's decision about ownership. Um, so. Then you ask what happens if the cultural authority hasn't found all the owners? Um, 
the 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 model law ref, uh, says that it should refer the matter to the persons involved to be resolved under customary law and practice. Um, however, very clear thinking and development uh, with the relevant customary uh, institutions and leaders is needed at the national implementation stage. It's not good enough to just create a concept of uh, and then delegate responsibilities uh, to resolving claims to the customary authorities without prior consultation. Um, customary institutions must be um, properly supported in preparation of such responsibilities. Um, also in the model law, it says that if they are satisfied there are no owners um, or there's no agreement that can be reached within a certain period, they can make a, a radical decision and say that they're the owners. All they need to do is just consult with the relevant minister um, and any benefits um, arising from any agreements that they have with prospective users must be used for traditional cultural development processes. Uh, interesting point is that it doesn't outline the possibility of holding the funds or benefits in trust while ownership is being determined. That is something that Vanuatu had noticed and so they have a provision, a specific provision around the traditional knowledge um, Expressions of culture fund to hold all um, benefits, um, fees from these agreements, uh, hold them in trust until uh, an owner or owners can be determined. So that is a very long uh, way of answering, but but I didn't really uh, explain the process around the ownership. Charlotte, yeah, can I can I can I ask a question, Spiros? Is that is that all right? Um, I just I just wanted to say, Sharon, that um, you mentioned the uh, WIPO's Women's Entrepreneur Network event. Um, and two of my colleagues who were involved in the project that I was working on in India, um, um, uh, the, the expert in marketing, Diego Rinalo, um, and my um, colleague who was the um, ICH expert, um, have both, Harriet Deacon, have both been involved in that network, both last year and this year as well. So it's very, you know, sort of small, small community. Um, but I guess there was a question that I, I wanted to ask the two of you, um, actually. Um, how do these laws work in practice? I mean, what what I mean, what what difference have they have they made in the countries in which um, you know sort of they operate? Because I mean, of course, they're not they don't work internationally, so they don't work across borders unless you've got a regional agreement that would bring them together. Um, so how do they how do they work in practice, and what do the communities who they are intended to benefit feel about them? I'll let you go first. Uh, yeah, oh. I'll let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, my my response will be short. Uh, we don't have much experience with the implementation of those laws because I don't think any action has been brought pursuant to those laws as yet. What we've had was. Uh, rounds of consultations first in 1998 when WIPO visited the region and that predates the formulation of the IGC and then we've had follow-up meetings with WIPO again funding the development of a regional framework for protection of traditional cultural expressions and traditional knowledge. Policy papers were developed. I was responsible for developing certain policy papers. And another colleague of mine, Dr. Marcus Goff, he drafted model legislation based on the policy papers. Now, that model legislation, I believe, was sent to the various ministers with responsibility for eventually implementing, taking to parliament the laws that could be modeled uh, against those that the model provisions that were drafted, but that has not happened yet. So we're still looking into it. I think Jamaica, out of all the Caribbean territories, if I were not mistaken, they decided that they would move forward. So a few years ago, they had additional further national consultations to go ahead to amend their legislation. I don't know if the discussions have advanced beyond that. So that's what's going on in the Caribbean. And funny enough, Charlotte, I was going to ask the same question of Purcell, <laughs> if they've had any 
experience with the implementation of the legislation? Um, and my answer is similar to yours. <laughs> I've, um, I tried to um, find information from New Year and Cook Islands about the implementation, but I was been unsuccessful in my attempts. Um, I did speak to, uh, I did find out some information about Vanuatu. Um, they passed their legislation in 2019, but they're still in the implementation process. They're still, um, they have their national competent authority which is equivalent to the National Cultural Authority, the Cultural Authority I mentioned, but they are still working with the um, the Council of Chiefs um, in developing guidelines uh, around um, how to determine ownership of traditional knowledge. Um, so it is a work in pro progress. Um, so what that tells me is that they've implemented the legislation um, and now they're going out to the communities for consultation, um, whereas I, uh, in my presentation, I kind of argue for the other way around uh, consultation yes. with communities, uh, because it's it's all good to have all these um, beautiful to have these all these rights, <laughs> but if they're not applicable to your own communities, then what's the point? Um, not to say anything ill about Vanuatu, um, but that's just uh, my view on that. Yes. It seems to me, um, I mean, that's that's really, you know, sort of very interesting that neither of you have yet had, um, you know, sort of knowledge of, you know, sort of how these things are working out in practice. I mean, it seems to me that this would be such a good time to do a, you know, sort of a research project around countries, you know, sort of in, in different regions of the world that have actually implemented these sort of domestic laws to protect um, folklore and traditional cultural expressions to find out what their practical, um, you know, yeah. sort of experience of uh, these actually are, because it seems to me, I mean, Purcell, I think you're right. I mean, it seems to me that they're, you know, not only are the content of the the laws different in different territories uh, to suit territories, you know, maybe not so much communities as you as you say, Purcell, but it would also be really interesting, I think, to, um, you know, sort of understand more about where those countries who have really developed the laws organically you know, sort of in consultation with the communities who they are going to affect, you know, whether that's any different to the ones who have said, wouldn't it be a good idea to have a law that we, you know, sort of bring in? What a nice, what a nice idea for a research project. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's profound. <laughs> uh, but but, yeah, it, 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 but it's, it's a good point also that uh, if you have that consultation with the community, then it, it raises the profile, it allows the community to understand what they what they could do if they want to explore it commercially, what, what is out there. It raises the profile, it, 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 it helps people uh, discuss what they have and what they can do with it, that I think it is important. I, I have another question that probably is for, 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 for all of you, but uh, what's happening with uh, what is already out there? What is out there in the public domain? How do you protect that? So what has been there for the last you know, 20, 50 years, do you, do you protect it or what you're trying to do is protect what, what is new, what will come out as a result of uh, the, uh, the roots process or, or uh, cultural and folklore process? Shall I say something first or you? Uh -huh. okay. Sharon, you going first, no? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can, um, from my personal perspective, I would like to reclaim what is already out there. That's my personal perspective. So I could give an example of the steel pan instruments, the steel pan musical instrument of Trinidad and Tobago, um, declared our national instrument. And at the time when the steel pan was being created collectively, it was actually deemed illegal to play that instrument. So even if one were to say at the point of creation, if we got past the identification of an inventor of the steel pan, assuming that we could have identified someone and historically there were several persons responsible for the development of the steel pan and various aspects of it. But even if we were to identify someone 40, 50, 60 years ago, 
it was deemed illegal at the time. So there could, no, could be no possibility of being granted a patent for it. Now that it, had, it has moved from the cultural fringe to the center to being accepted as our national instrument, there are many, there are different countries in the world that have patents in relation to our national instrument. And from a personal perspective, I would like to reclaim that, the possibility of reclaiming ownership, so to speak. But that's from my personal perspective. I know that it's very difficult to, in, to enact laws retroactively. I appreciate the difficulty. There's a difficulty of sorting out third party rights. People have already you know, acquired rights to it. But from a personal perspective, that is what I would like to see. So in a way, we would like to reclaim social ownership of uh, what is out there. From you would like to reclaim social ownership in a way. Yes, yes, yes. Well, certainly uh, a right to be identified as yes. the originator, as you say. Yes. Marcel. Yes. So. With the, with the model law, it doesn't clearly address the, the, that particular issue um, dealing with traditional knowledge. It's already uh, spread from its ancestral location and it's being used for various parts in, within the, the country or even outside the Pacific Islands. Um, Sharon mentioned uh, one example. Uh, another example is firewalking, um, which I don't remember where in particular where it belongs to, but I believe it's in the, the owners are based in Fiji. Um, I think with Palau, um, they have their own uh, traditional knowledge bill. Um, I think it was back in 20, 2005, but I haven't seen any movement since then. But uh, in their bill, it did talk about did talk about this issue uh, and requiring all pre-existing non-customary uses uh, to be registered with the relevant authority within a certain time period after the legislation has taken effect, and then. After a certain time period, the legislation, the legislation is taken to effect. Um, those people who use that knowledge um, for the non customary use have to either say a statement that uh, acknowledging that this has come from the owners, um, whether that be uh, a statement or uh, under a, a photo or a statement prior to the performance. Um, but yes, um, Sharon has mentioned it. It's quite difficult to go. Um, it's, it's, it's such a complex uh, machine, and so there's a lot of work around finding a solution around that. But, um. If I may add, Charlotte, before uh, you, you speak, if I may, there's also the issue of misappropriation from within the community. So it's not always an external issue. It's also an internal issue. Charlotte? Yeah, um, it, you know, su su such an interesting and such a complex, um, you know, sort of question. I think one of the things that we did in our project, and you've mentioned the, you know, sort of uh, roots and fruits tool that we used again, was that we, we tried to conceptualize, and when I say we, I mean, we did work co-create with the communities. What, what we thought about as the roots were the skills, knowledges, practices, um, which were the intangible, which are the intangible cultural heritage. The fruits are the ways that those are actually represented. So the fruits are, you know, of, of, of Cho dance um, intangible heritage are the dances themselves. Um, we worked with Patachichu painters and the skills of the painter um, are represented in the scroll. That is the fruits. The skills are the uh, are the roots. So this, in some ways, avoids having to talk about, um, you know, sort of as, as part of the intangible heritage, the actual thing itself. And it also enables the communities to innovate with their with their with their skills and knowledge. It's almost if you think about copyright, it's the pre-expressive stage of copyright. It's the it's the it's the embodied knowledge that is within the people that then actually comes out in the in the form of the object or the artifact. 
And in looking at it like that, there is no difficulty in saying that those objects and artifacts where there is some element of originality for the purposes of copyright um, is, is actually protected by copyright. The very traditional things wouldn't be, but the, the um, Cho dance around COVID-19 would be protected by copyright once it was fixed. Or the Patachitra painter's scroll that they represented 9-11 would be protected. They're still using their heritage skills, but the output, the expressive output, can then be protected by copyright. And I think that this is, you know, sort of really where we, um, you know, sort of how we try to think about issues around, well, not only public domain, because, you know, I mean, if you talk about that is, if you think about that in terms of public domain, which of course is a very Western, you know, sort of concept anyway, um, you know, sort of in that, you know, sort of, can you actually take the heritage community skills? You can take a, you know, a representation of it, but you can't take the actual community's um, skills themselves. And then you, you know, sort of, then we also in that, um, you know, at, at a slight tangent, also, you know, sort of thought about the term misappropriation, which um, um, Sharon and Purcell, you've both used in your, you know, sort of in your presentations. And one of the questions, you know, sort of for us became, well, what is meant by misappropriation? Because there's no, um, you know, sort of legally, either nationally or internationally, I think, you know, sort of accepted term of what misappropriation actually is. And in our project, we had a um, you know, sort of a real discussion about whether we should use the term misappropriation. And for some people, misappropriation was any form of taking of anything. Um, so for this story I gave you about Mashimi, the Cho dancer, who wasn't attributed um, on the film, the fact that she wasn't attributed on the film was termed a misappropriation. And for other people, so, you know, sort of that's almost misappropriating in broad terms, taking of you know, sort of public domain type of things, only of course she does have an intellectual property right to be credited on a, on a film. Um, for others, using the term misappropriation would be a very good idea because it shamed multinational corporations into, um, you know, sort of not doing, you know, sort of it shamed them if they did something. Purcell, you had some lovely examples uh, there. It shamed them if they did, you know, take something um, uh, and, you know, sort of encourage them to apologize uh, for doing that. Uh, for others, um, you know, there was the argument that actually the term misappropriation should not be used at all. Because if you use the term misappropriation, what you tend to move towards, you allied the term misappropriation with property rights, because misappropriation tends to come more from the sort of, um, you know, sort of property side of things. And if you look at the literature, there is reference to misappropriation of cultural property, for instance, intangible cultural property. And um, so these two get elided. And then if you elide those two, what you do is to start to think about intangible heritage as a property right. And that starts to elide it, intangible heritage with intellectual property. Um, which, you know, you, you might like, but a lot of people don't want to align those two. You might want to align those two, but there's perhaps something quite special about thinking about intangible heritage as the, the embodied skills and knowledge of communities, um, which is a very different way of, you know, sort of Western thinking about intellectual property rights. So, you know, sort of, I, I, I mean, you know, sort of Sharon and Purcell, I totally agree with the two of you. The whole thing is really, you know, sort of quite confused and very, you know, sort of complex about how you deal, you know, sort of with what the Western, you know, sort of system thinks about the public domain. And I think part of the challenge we've had is to try and shoehorn this idea of embodied skills and knowledge into a Western property concept. It's, I'm not sure if that answered your question, Spiral. <laughs> Sorry. The answer, but I think the only thing we can do is it's 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 done. May I, may I add something to what Charlotte just mentioned? I think that indigenous communities, religious communities, local communities face a bit of a dilemma because if your cultural expressions are being exploited and already propertized by others. How do you combat this? Do you propertize it yourself 
And then you run into this challenge about decontextualization. So, so, how, so in an attempt to combat the very thing that may be offensive, you probably adopt the, a similar kind of strategy to protect yourself. So you're walking this line of, should I propertize or not propertize? How do I combat misappropriation? How do I deal with that? Is there a way that I can commercialize, if I choose to do so, aspects of my culture, but still maintain the integrity of it? And that is the, you know, the double-edged sword, that's the balancing act, I believe that, and the questions that communities will be asking themselves. There are two things, also, there is a link between uh, national protection, protection at the national level, uh, and protection at the international level, I think the Nike example is, is brilliant because you can see how it, it was the, uh, the noise, the negative noise about Nike that pushed Nike to uh, take a step back. Uh, but sometimes my, my worry is that from a commercial exploitation perspective, uh, by introducing legislation at the national level, you can make it more difficult uh, for the communities to exploit what they have at the international level. Uh, and I think that there's an interesting balance there that we need to maintain. From a trademark lawyer's perspective, I found fascinating the uh, all the Budweiser cases. So you have the, the US Budweiser and the Czech uh, Budweiser. Uh, the Czechs uh, some, sometimes they use trademark law, sometimes they try to use geographical uh, indication uh, uh, protection. And you can see how the arguments when you use geographical indication protection can undermine sometimes your trademark law arguments and, and vice versa. So I think it's interesting here that you, you need to have a balance and sometimes impossible that will allow communities to exploit what they're producing internationally because this is how they can make money out of the whole thing. Uh, and, and the voting money is something about that, you know, you need to, to be able to benefit from what you are creating. Uh, and, and how do you balance that by protecting the integrity of, 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 of what you are protecting within the jurisdiction? That is make commercial exploitation more difficult. Another question that we cannot answer. <laughs> <laughs> we need a, 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 a longer conversation. Uh, but the national, national uh, distinction, I think, I think is important. I think Marcel also uh, dealt with it to, 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 to some extent in his, in his presentation. Yeah. Can I ask a question on that, Spiros? The um, you know, sort of as you're as you're a uh, you know, sort of trademark and, and geographical in, indication um, expert. I mean, to to what extent you know, thinking about um, rather than defensive protection, but thinking about positive promotional protection, which goes a little bit into um, Sharon's point about. Um, you know, sort of how do you, how, you know, should the community commercialize in order to keep, you know, sort of other people away? I mean, there's something there about reputation and needing to say, um, you know, this is something that has come from the community. This is a community thing. This is not somebody else's who has, you know, sort of taken our, um, you know, sort of, um, I'm not going to use the word appropriation, but, you know, sort of, they are misrepresenting themselves as, um, as, as us. Um, you know, as coming from, you know, as being a particular source. I mean, to what extent then can geographical indications help with that type of, um, you know, sort of strategy by communities, you know, to say, this is ours, um, you know, this is the source of where this, you know, sort of particular intangible heritage fruit actually came from? Spyros, you're muted. Spyros, you're still muted. I, uh, I wish I had the button to mute other people I said at the beginning. Not <laughs> in Spyros. Okay, so I muted myself. Uh, and and uh, yes, certainly, uh, geographical indications will have a bigger role to play in the future. Uh, 
if you look at the, the expansion of what you can protect under geographical indications and the, the European push for geographical indications, possibly uh, this could be a way uh, to, to give more meaningful commercial protection, but at the same time, lead to an extent with integrity issues. I think collecting marks and uh, certification marks uh, potentially uh, are the way forward uh, from a commercial uh, perspective, because this is something that uh, you can try and develop an international strategy that doesn't need to be uh, uh, very expensive. But the question is how many jurisdictions recognize collective and certification marks and how many jurisdictions would recognize collective certification marks that are not in the jurisdiction. Uh, so it's 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 it is tricky, uh, but from a commercial perspective, I think that uh, it's it's uh, copyright design, geographical indication, uh, collective marks, uh, uh, certification marks, and to an extent, collective marks and certification marks deal with this attribution issue uh, to an extent, because because I, I suppose you can be much more. Uh, you can have TL attribution under uh, the, the rules for a collective or, or, or certification mark. Well, under collective mark. Uh, so I, I think this, 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 this could be uh, something uh, interesting. And it, it, it gives you also practical immediate protection uh, that, 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 that you need sometimes. That's why I found the, the, the the trademark that you mentioned uh, as part, you know, owned by an association in India, I thought was uh, quite an interesting uh, option. Uh, but I, I, I like, I find fascinating the Indian case because you see how, in a very short period of time, things have moved uh, forward uh, so effectively uh, through the interaction with. Uh, the community. Are there any, any questions from uh, on my question answer uh, uh, section? I see only one question. Are there any other questions that uh, people have asked and are not visible to me because maybe they have been uh, sent to uh, you as individuals? Are there any questions that you have received? There are. No? There are not. There are not. Okay, good. Well, not good, but <laughs> uh, if there are any questions, please do ask uh, uh, the questions. We do have uh, a couple of minutes uh, left. Going back to the toolkit that uh, uh, you mentioned at the beginning, uh, Charlotte, I, I think that's interesting uh, because I'm very practical uh, and also it allows parties to understand what they're talking about. So I see, I see the relevance for, of, of the toolkits for the local community. To what extent you are trying to make the lawyers understand the relevance of the toolkit as well? Uh, because I, I, I think this, this, is, this is very important because then they know what the local community wants, what the local community needs. Uh, and often the perspective of an intellectual property lawyer uh, is, is, is quite restricted. They want to protect uh, without caring too much uh, about exploitation. Uh, whereas if you have the toolkit, uh, it allows a more effective, more efficient communication, I suppose, between whoever is advising the local community and the local community. So, are you trying to promote the toolkit to lawyers as well? Uh, or you see it as something that will help the local community understand what they can do uh, with uh, uh, their cultural property? The um, property. Yeah, the, the, the toolkit isn't aimed at lawyers as such, and it does contain, you know, sort of some information very broadly about some of the relevant IP rights. So it's, it says something about copyright, it says something about performers rights, and it says something um, about GIs and, and trademarks. It doesn't go into patents because um, 
partly because our project was was really involved with the creative rights as opposed to the uh, as opposed to as opposed to you know sort of patents and in uh, and inventions and partly because you have to have a limit somewhere as well i think um it's not it's not aimed at lawyers because we in in india and in other countries which may use it we are acutely aware that there may not be the resources available for people to get um, legal advice, formal legal advice or formal marketing advice. So that information hopefully is, you know, sort of wrapped up in some of the information in the toolkit. It's really aimed at NGOs, at um, at the communities themselves, and it's meant to be a, a something that you're able to sort of dip in and dip out. Um, so, you know, sort of it might be useful, there might be a tool that might be useful for a particular project that somebody's doing around the commercialization of intangible heritage, like, for example, the Roots and Fruits tool. We've also got the, a number of the other slides that I showed um, are also represented um, in the toolkit. We've also got in there case studies to talk, which talk about, which, you know, sort of take you through things like the Cho Dance case study and some of the evaluation that comes out. So it's really meant to be an NGO, um, you know, sort of type of um, NGO and community tool as opposed to a lawyer's tool. Um, we came, we also did in the India project, I mean, we, we, we do have a number of different outputs and we also did a couple of policy papers for um, uh, some of the Indian policy makers. And even there that we we stopped short of saying something like, you know, sort of it would be really good or, you know, sort of a, a policy recommendation is that you have a um, an organisation set up that can then come in and give marketing and intellectual property advice to communities. And that was largely because we felt, well, in, in consultation with the NGO that we were working with, Bang Lan Attack, who were very deeply um, connected to the policy environment, uh, both in West Bengal and India more generally. Um, but it was felt that an, that sort of approach would just not be practical and suggesting something that was simply not going to be implemented might turn any policymaker, you know, sort of really, you know, sort of off the idea of, you know, sort of thinking about what else was in the in the policy paper. So we, you know, sort of very much put our policy recommendations around existing policies that the that the, um, you know, sort of the various um, uh, organizations and departments had already implemented. So, for instance, there was one on tourism that, you know, sort of talked an awful lot about infrastructure and, um, you know, and, and, uh, yeah, infrastructure, including roads, and it talked about accommodation, but there was almost, there was no focus on communities um, and how communities could actually communities were, are at the heart of a sustainable tourism policy. The communities we were working with, the marginalised communities in rural areas. Um, so, you know, the learning from our project, we were able to put in there to talk about, you know, sort of commercialisation whilst focusing on intangible cultural heritage and the need then for some form of training in IP rights and things like that. Um, does, that does that answer your question in rather a long way? The, you know, I thought it would be useful for lawyers because we have become so specialized and technical in terms of how we approach things. So that then the people that we give advice to need someone to explain the advice that we're giving. Uh, so, 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 so we, we, I think I thought it would be useful to help the lawyer understand uh, the context and, and what is required. Uh, so. Yeah. Hopefully it will do that. And it's all available mostly on a CCBY basis. And I've put the um, address where it can, where the, uh, where the a lot, number of the materials that we did um, can actually be, uh, can actually be found um, on that website and free to use um, attribution, of course. Um, but uh, yeah. <laughs> what was it there? Yeah. I think it would be useful. Yeah. So I, I will get that. Uh, any points about the toolkit, uh, Sharon or Marcel? Do you think that you would like to uh, borrow the concept? We also have a question, Spiros, in there. In there. Yes. I'll let you go. <laughs> Actually, I was going to um go back to uh, not the toolkit which is a it's an excellent idea actually to have 
something practical for the communities to use uh, after the project is over, okay? After you've inter done the interactions with them. But I, I was interested in, the, uh, there's a part of Charlotte's presentation, I believe when she was, when her group was sensitizing the community about their project. And I think she, you said that there, it was co-created, yeah? And you use storytelling and face-to-face -face meetings. And I found that was really interesting. You use tools that the community was familiar with in, in transmitting their own cultural expressions to educate them about intellectual property rights. And I found that was interesting. And that also goes back to another comment you made. Why aren't the, let the laws that we have in place, how come they've not been used? And maybe it's because they've been handed down and a lot of people may not be familiar with them so that sensitization process probably did not take place so they may not know that there's something that can be used to assist them with the protection of their their cultural expressions i mean that's i mean that's you know it's, it, it they didn't i mean they did know something that's not that's not fair because they did know um you know sort of something or at least some of them knew something about intellectual property rights to be copyright in particular you know there's always the idea of you know sort of um i can't control it it's an almost innate copyright knowledge you know i can't control my recording on the internet you know these sort of these sort of things um which was you know sort of which was really um interesting um and the embodied methods that we used um were were, were great you know i mean the first meeting that we had with the communities and we worked through an expert who works for bang man attack in and he's an expert in forum theater so we were able to you know sort of communicate with each other through this you know through this embodied movement which was which was lovely i mean it really was you know sort of really really good um, so yeah, they were they were great. They were great methods to use. It was just you know sort of unfortunate that the pandemic hit in halfway through, so we couldn't you know. But we did we did finish we did finish it. Um, can I can I respond to Petra's uh, comment in the in the chat, Spiros? Would that be would that be okay? Um, I'm sure somebody else will will want to as well. But um, uh, given that you know sort of a lot of what I was talking about was was in it, it was about the commercialization of intangible heritage, I think. Um, and that was what our project was about. Um, I think a couple of things here. And absolutely, there is, uh, you know, sort of for many, including a very strong view in UNESCO, um, that intangible heritage um, should not be commercialized or, or yes, a recognition that it can be commercialized, but there's a problem with over commercialization without actually articulating or conceptualizing what over commercialization actually means. Um, there are absolutely communities who have intangible intangible cultural heritage who do not want to commercialize that intangible cultural heritage and nobody should ever encourage those those communities to do anything of the sort the communities that we worked with um had already been working with banglan attack over the past 10 years who had brought them out of abject uh, poverty through careful commercialization of their intangible heritage and it was commercialization that the communities wanted to do it wasn't commercialization by any manner of means that was actually imposed on the communities um and we would certainly have not have gone and tried to work with communities who hadn't thought about it commercializing their intangible heritage there's a very interesting question about when a community might be ready to move to the next step which is almost what we were coming in with when you know sort of they've commercialized a bit they maybe want to think about doing more um you know what is that stage um you know of development and it's exactly the same question that's asked in um you know sort of more western and you know sort of and indeed we've we've had a project in south africa where we were asking the sort of question that you know how at what stage of development might a community actually need to be in order to be ready to think about marketing and intellectual property in in conjunction with with commercialization um which we didn't answer um i mean that's a, that's a very difficult question to answer but there is it does remain a question as to when it's appropriate to come in with these sorts of different sorts of thinkings and, and new sorts of skills um but yeah i think also if you think about 
I mean, there, there are absolutely, and Purcell, you know, sort of raised a number of these, there are absolutely types of intangible cultural heritage that should not be commercialized. They're sacred, they're secret. Uh, communities don't want to commercialize them. They want to, they want to keep control of them. There are, in, in other cases, there may be types of intangible cultural heritage which exist, which the communities may be interested in making a living from, but which may disappear if they're not, if the community can't make a living from them. And that's where I think the intangible communities, that, that the heritage communities that we work with were at when Banglan Attack started working with them 10 years ago. So they wanted to make a living from, the, from their heritage. They just didn't know how to go about it. So Petra, I, all I can say is I absolutely agree with you. Not all intangible heritage is right for commercialization. In in our roots and fruits tool, which you know, sort of, do, you know, sorry, sorry to keep you know, sort of harking on about this one, but it is something we used quite a lot. That was really intended to get the to to encourage the communities to focus very much on the skills, knowledges, practices, the embodied intangible heritage that was important to them, which they could then go out and use. And then there would be some things that they simply didn't want to do. Um, because it was, you know, sort of, um, it didn't suit their their uh, intangible heritage, or um, for for whatever reason. So it, I think it is very, um, a, 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 you know, sort of a very sensitive area, um, and um, yeah. Uh, Sharon and Marcel can also answer the, the, you know response to Petra's uh, comment. Uh, and then I think we have reached uh, eleven thirty. Uh, Endpoint. So, Sean? My short answer is yes. <laughs> That's my short answer. <laughs> yes. Uh, I agree with my learned friends. <laughs> yeah, excellent. <laughs> so, Petra, thank you for bringing us back to uh, 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 where we started, uh, really. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to uh, the organizers, and I have to confirm, confess that from uh, the British Institute perspective, I'm very happy, uh, delighted that we contributed as well to uh, the announcement uh, of this, this conference. Uh, I hope many more will come. Uh, I think this was a wonderful uh, discussion. Thank you. Uh, and let's hope that next time we would be uh, meeting uh, in person. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>